Excellent. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm, I'm very happy to be with you this morning um, to talk about uh, work we've done on understanding charge transport in these halide perovskite um, materials. And I guess I don't really need to introduce the subject for this conference. Um, of course, the interest in halide perovskites is primarily driven by their applications in photovoltaics. Um, but because they are clean semiconductors with kind of uh, exceptionally um, uh, exceptional uh, semiconducting properties, of course, it's also interesting to explore their use in other applications. And the application that's of interest for my talk today is the application in field effect transistors. And that's um, an application that's been pursued um, very early on, uh, a few years after the um, uh, first discovery of these halide perovskites, how well they work in solar cells. Um, there's a number of groups studied, started studying their charge transport properties and uh, using them in FETs. And I've got on this slide, I've got a couple of um, references. Um, and what became clear um, at that time is that uh, there is um, evidence often in, in fast spectroscopy that mobilities in these systems can be very high. But when you actually make a transistor, often um, device performance is much more difficult to control. And the main problem that we, we had at the time with these uh, perovskite transistors is illustrated on this slide. This is one of our first MAPBI3 FETs that we made in Cambridge. And um, you can see that the current is very low. Um, there is very limited field modulation um, in, observed, and we could only observe um, this behavior at very low temperatures. And the reason for that is that these are, of course, ionic materials where you have um, um, a certain concentration of ionic defects. And in an FET, these ionic defects can migrate. And in particular, when you apply a gate voltage, um, they can migrate towards the active interface between the semiconducting perovskite and the gate dielectric. In this case, you can see that for a top gate architecture. And um, when these uh, ionic defects then um, accumulate at the active interface, um, they basically form a charge, a layer of charges that is able to um, screen that electric field. And then you have fewer um, electronic carriers that can accumulate it at that interface. And that leads to a reduction in, in mobility or in apparent mobility. And it also leads to quite large hysteresis effects that you can see here um, indicated in this diagram. So in order to make this, uh, we had to really investigate the origin of this and had to find ways to mitigate this ion migration in order to be able to study uh, field effect transistors cleanly. And so um, to do this, we started out by um, studying the dependence on the microstructure. And so you can see here some improved um, uh, MAPBI3 um, transistors where we've basically tuned the size of the, the grain size um, by using a, um, um, a different um, um, precursor method um, and, and, and by increasing the grain size from here 0.25 micron to 0.75 micron, or sorry, from 38 nanometer to 149 nanometers, um, we were able to improve transistor performance. And, and, and also we're starting to see um, the um, ability to measure these devices at room temperature, although of course at room temperature mobility, the uh, measured mobility is significantly smaller. And that's because at room temperature ions are more likely to migrate and you get more effective screening um, as uh, at room temperature than you get at 100 Kelvin. Um, we then investigated also the role of contacts. Um, when you make a, a contact to a perovskite semiconductor with uh, an, what you presumably think is an inert metal, in this case, um, we deposited gold electrodes on top of a single crystal of, um, in this case, not MAPBI3, but MAPB, I mean, the bromine uh, version of um, um, the perovskite. Um, so this is a um, luminescent crystal that you can see here with two electrodes that were deposited on top of that single crystal. 
and we used a single crystal to well reduce the defect density as much as we could. And then we biased that device um, for a period of time. And then afterwards delaminated the contacts. Um, we, we had a technique in which we could remove the contacts afterwards and then image the crystal as you can see it here. And you can see clearly that underneath the positive electrode, um, there is a reduction in photoluminescence intensity, suggesting that there is some you know, degradation of the perovskite underneath the positively biased electrode. And we saw evidence when we looked at the kind of surface uh, analysis in, of this region that had actually been a reaction between the gold um, electrode and the, um, the perovskite. And so clearly contacts need also to be investigated and optimized when you, um, when you construct these um, perovskite transistors. Um, um, the next step in our investigation was to look at the dependence on composition. So here you can see um, a, a comparison of the room temperature characteristics of MAPBI3 together with some um, met mixed metal, um, uh, sorry, mixed, mixed uh, uh, cation composition. So in, this, in the panel in the middle, we have a mixture of um, formidinium and methyl ammonium um, cations. And on the um, a panel on the right, we've mixed in also um, rubidium. Um, and these are, of course, compositions that have been well studied for solar cell and, and LED applications. But we can see here that the, um, this kind of mixed metal, mixed, halo, mixed, sorry, mixed cation compositions also um, um, improve the stability. We see less hysteresis. Um, with the FA composition, we see actually a reduction in current, so the mobility is somewhat reduced. But with the um, rubidium, you can see that the current is very similar to what you get for NEAT MAPBI3, but the hysteresis is much reduced, and we can make a reasonably stable um, FET, and we achieve mobilities um, that are somewhat less than, I mean, uh, uh, the maximum mobility we were able to achieve with this approach was on the order of 0.5 centimeters squared per volt second. Um, and then we asked ourselves the question, I mean, of course, in an FET, um, the key part of the semiconductor is the surface region, because that's the region that's in contact with the gate dielectric and where most of the charge transport happens. And so we asked ourselves, how clean are these surfaces actually, and are there ways in which we can passivate defects um, on the surface? And my student, Xiao Jian Xie, he developed an approach for passivating the surface of these um, halide perovskites, which in essentially involved um, um, washing steps um, or cleaning steps in a carefully selected um, solvent. Um, and so, of course, when you, when you wash the surface with a solvent, you don't want the um, solvent to um, yeah, wash away the film or, um, or um, change the grain morphology of the perovskite. You merely want to um, remove defective species from the surface. And if that solvent is too polar, then, then, then clearly you um, change the morphology. But if the surface is too non, if the solvent is too non-polar, you don't do much, you can't dissolve anything. So he selected um, a, from a range of um, uh, solvents, which you can see on the bottom here, he selected a combination of solvent that had just had the right polarity to effectively clean defective species from the surface. And then in the second step, which he called the healing step, he exposed the surface to a solution of um, methyl ammonium iodide, MAI, um, to, in a sense, enrich the surface again in, um, in, um, in, in iodine. And, and then finally, a second cleaning step to, to just uh, remove any uh, remaining um, soluble species from the surface. And this quite complicated surface, I mean, it's not complicated, it's three um, um, solvent cleaning steps, but this solvent uh, process allowed him to um, basically um, yeah, provide a passivated surface. And you can see here on this uh, view graph on the bottom, you can see here, um, how this works when it's uh, an, when an amplified process, when you, when you do this process, not just for the normal 20-minute um, time, um, as we would normally do it in the process, but for an extended time of two weeks. Um, and you can see here that for different solvents, um, 
that if, if you choose a two polar solvent, then clearly you get a re, re, a, a dissolution of the material and a recrystallization, and that's not desirable. But if you pick the right um, solvent combination, you can achieve that even after two weeks, there is little evidence, only some minor rearrangement of the surface structure, but little evidence for a major uh, recrystallization. And that's the condition that we want to be in, in order to clean this surface effectively. Um, and we've obtained evidence from scanning Kelvin probe microscopy, that's something I don't want to discuss in detail. Um, in these measurements, we can effectively see evidence for ion migration, um, because when ions migrate, they screen the potentials that are applied to the source and the drain electrode, and you can see that as a um, change in the surface potential. And so in these measurements, um, we are able to see direct evidence that the um, in these, this treatment results in a significant reduction in the um, in ion migration. In this case, it's ion migration along the channel in the plane of the film. Um, and we also see evidence for um, improved device performance. You can see that here. Um, the red device um, on the left panel is the pristine device where we have done no surface treatment. And then after the first cleaning step, you can see that these various treatments in different um, solvent blends, um, they lead to an improved device performance. Um, if we measure the device after the healing step, the second healing step, um, the device performance is not quite as good as after the first cleaning step. But then after the second cleaning step, we have much improved device performance and it's orders of magnitude better than the initial, the red device here, the pristine device, the on current is three orders of magnitude higher or so. And so we've optimized this process and here you can see the performance of an optimized um, MAPBI3 device that's been made in this process. You can see the grain morphology um, at the bottom. And in this um, uh, device, we are able to achieve clean transistor characteristics at room temperature. So the red uh, characteristic here um, is the um, device that was treated in this way. There is some minor hysteresis, but the mobility is high. We reach a, a mobility up to four or five centimeters squared per volt second, which is two orders or three orders of magnitude higher than the, the device that was where with the surface treatment was not applied. And if we cool the device down to low temperature to 80 Kelvin, we get a mobility um, of 10. And that's a very, I mean, for a perovskite, this is a very well-defined device. We get a high reliability factor when we extract the mobility. So we are very confident about these mobility values. Um, this technique is applicable to a range of perovskite compositions. Um, so you can see here um, um, several um, mixed metal um, and mixed, uh, sorry, mixed, uh, sorry, mixed cation and, and, and anion compositions. Um, these are typically used in LEDs um, and, and you can see that we can get also clean and much improved characteristics over the pristine device. The pristine devices are here in circles and the triangles are for the treated devices. And we can uh, even see ambipolar characteristics in this case because of that mixed um, iodine bromine composition that induces ambipolar transport in the perovskite. And the whole transport is a little bit um, less effective than the electron transport in this case, but it's evidence that we can you know, well, tune the Fermi level cleanly from P-type accumulation into N-type accumulation. That's evidence for very clean semiconducting um, behavior. Um, What's, in, what's even more interesting about this process is that it even works to resurrect devices that were made initially under slightly non-optimum conditions. And so you can see here um, examples of films that were processed initially under conditions where the device performance is, um, is poor. Um, and then this cleaning, healing, uh, cleaning treatment was applied. And maybe I want to draw your attention um, to this panel here, um, where we initially applied a, a, an iodine or an MAI rich um, composition when we made the films. And that leads to, um, at room temperature, an almost not measurable transistor. Um, and then we took this film and actually resurrected it by applying this, um, this treatment. And you can see here a device 
after this cleaning healing treatment device uh, treatment, the MRI rich device um, actually performs very well, and we get an almost optimum um, mobility at room temperature. So um, this this treatment allows you to um, correct for yeah, non optimization in the initial um, deposition of the films. And that what I find particularly um, interesting about this is that it also allows you to observe actually p-type behavior in these materials. Normally, um, these uh, MAPBI3 devices are n-type, um, but if we choose the right contact modification and a simple SEM treatment of the gold electrodes um, increases the work function, um, and that allows you then to see n-type uh, p-type transport in these materials with also quite a respectable mobility. In this case, we achieve a mobility of 2.1 centimeter squared per volt second um, compared to the pristine device, which has a much lower um, mobility. And these are quite well, well behaved transistors um, where we, we see I show you here some uniformity um, over an, an kind of tens of devices. You can see that um, these mobility values are not one-offs, they are quite reproducibly achievable under a kind of optimized conditions. And also uh, on the bottom, you see some bias stress experiments where we've applied a bias stress um, to both the um, P-type device and the N-type device for a couple of hours. So 12 hours um, is the long, longest time that this bias stress was applied for. And you can see that there is a threshold voltage shift and that's quite a, I mean, it's not, it's a, a quite significant threshold voltage shift up to 10 volts in this case. Um, um, that's of course not ideal, but at least compared to where we started, um, if I, I should remember, you remember the first characteristics that I showed you, this is a massive improvement and we still can start to do um, reliable FET measurements and study the origin of these residual threshold voltage shifts like you could do in any um, TFT technology. If you, of course, it, if you want to use these devices and applications that threshold voltage shift is still too large, but at least we have now a basis for understanding where these residual threshold voltage shifts come from and improve, improve, um, improve the stability. And then finally, um, I wanted to um, mention kind of some ongoing work that we are currently doing. I don't have the time to discuss that in detail. Um, and that is to understand the um, the detailed defect um, um, effect of specific defects on the um, on the characteristics of FETs and on the charge transport. What you can see here is um, an observation where um, you um, uh, actually, this is um, devices that were not made with this cleaning, healing, cleaning treatment, but where we were going back to, um, and, and, yeah, uh, this is, uh, these are anti-solvent crystallized films. And um, you see here how the um, non-idealities in the device characteristic depends on depend on composition. So if we hit the composition of the films just right, um, you can see that um, these devices are quite reproducible. We, when we measure them for the first time, cycle one already produces a high um, device performance with a high current, and then subse subsequent cycles, essentially, um, there's a little bit of an increase in current in the second cycle, but afterwards the device is pretty stable. But if you don't hit the right composition, if you just a few percent with um, excess uh, lead iodide, um, then you see a current built-up effect where you actually have to measure the device several times um, before it reaches a high current. Um, and that becomes even more apparent here in the 7.5% um, lead iodide excess sample. And a similar thing also happens in the um, with a lead iodide deficient sample where actually the current tends to be a bit lower if you have 5% here um, deficient. Um, the current is not as high as in the perfectly stoichiometric film. And we are starting to understand kind of the, the role of specific defects that we can induce with these um, non-ideal compositions in the charge transport characteristics. <clears throat> 